Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willing. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, And see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Father John Powell is a Jesuit priest who taught for many years at Loyola University in Chicago. And in his book entitled Unconditional Love that sold millions of copies, he tells the story of the time that he was teaching a class entitled theology of faith. And on the first day of class, he was just watching the students as they paraded inside, and he noticed this strange-looking guy, rather tall and lean, who had the longest hair he'd ever seen on a young man, came six inches below his shoulders. At that time, he'd never seen anybody with such long hair, and as soon as he saw him, he made a mental note to himself, Under S, he said, that guy's strange. Just filed that away for a while. And he went on, and sure enough, as the class proceeded through the semester, his prophecy came true that this young man by the name of Tommy became the resident atheist of the class. Everything Father John Powell tried to teach about faith, Tommy raised his hand, questioned, doubted, argued, and so on. On the last day of the class of the semester, as everyone was finishing their exam, Tommy finished his and came forward, placed it on Father Powell's desk, and then looked at him and said, Father, hey, do you ever think I'll find God? And trying a little shock therapy, Father Powell answered, No, I don't think so. And Tommy, in his typical cynical tone, said, Huh, I thought that's who you were trying to 
promote and push and walked away. But before Tommy got to the door to leave, Father Powell said, hey, Tommy, I don't think you'll ever find God, but I'm absolutely sure he will find you. Another shrug of the shoulders, and he said, huh. And Father Powell said, yep, that S still belongs there. He didn't even catch what a clever line that was. As he describes in his book, it was a couple years later he heard, fortunately, Tommy had graduated. But unfortunately, he also had contacted terminal cancer. And even more interesting, it was just a few weeks later after hearing that sad news that Tommy came to Father John Powell's office to visit him. And as he walked in, the first thing Father Powell noticed is all of his hair was gone because of the chemotherapy treatments that he had been receiving. And then Father Powell said, Tommy, how are you? Tommy went on to explain about his terminal cancer that had filled both of his lungs. And if the doctors were only giving him what they would guess a couple weeks to live. And then Tommy said, Father, I want to tell you something. You were right. Remember the last day of class when I handed in the exam and I asked you whether I'd ever find God? And you said, no, you were right. When I found out I had cancer, I'm telling you, I banged on heaven's door so long and so hard, I thought my knuckles were bleeding. I prayed on my knees so long and heard nothing that I thought for sure there is no God. I even gave up on him, to be honest. And knowing, though, that I only had a couple weeks to live, one evening when my father had come home from work and just after the family had shared supper, he was sitting in his usual chair before the TV with the newspaper in front of him. And I came up to my dad and I said, hey, Dad, can we talk? He said, the newspaper came down a couple inches. And my father said, yeah, talk. Dad, before I die, I, I just want you to know I love you. Tommy said, at that point, two things happened that he never saw from his father in his whole life of 24 years. The first thing is that his father dropped the paper and hugged his son for the first time as an adult man. And the second thing he had never heard before from his father, his dad said, Tommy, I really love you too. He went on to say they spent the whole evening and even through the night just talking to each other, catching up for many lost years. They began to really share things that he held deep down inside. And it was the most marvelous night and morning. He said they even talked so his father had to leave for work. Never had that ever happened in his lifetime that he could recall. Can you imagine? So he said, Father, you were right. I never found God, but something happened. I decided since this went pretty well with my father, I should try it on my mother. It was much easier, though. <laughs> and Mom hugged me and told me she loved me. And I thought if it worked so well with Mom and Dad, why not try it on my brothers and sisters? And you know, it even worked with them. I didn't know what to expect, but they told me they loved me too and held me. And and then something really strange happened. I, I don't know how. I'm not sure even exactly when, but it was just about that same time I realized that God was trying to speak through my father. That God was trying to communicate to me through my mother. That God was trying to reach out to me through my brothers and my sisters. And all of a sudden, I really felt his presence and believed in his love. You're right, Father. 
I didn't find God, but he sure found me. Father Powell said, all of a sudden, that S he put on his forehead changed from strange to saint. He said he always makes that mistake, you know. As soon as he thinks he understands people and tries to label them, he finds out how wrong he is. He said to Tommy, he said, Tommy, would you do me a favor? Would you mind coming to my theology of faith class and speaking to my students? If you could just tell them what you just told me. Golly, it would help so many people. Would you do that? Tommy said, oh, Father, I, I'm no example of faith, you know. <laughs> yes, you are, Tommy. Yes, you are. Well, for you, I owe it to you. Okay, all right. And they set a date a week later. As that day arrived, I should say two days before that day arrived, Father Powell received a phone call that Tommy wouldn't be able to make it. He was deathly sick. And in fact, one day later, he died. But before he hung up the phone for the last time he would speak to him, he asked Father Powell, would you do me a favor? Would you tell your students about what I've learned about faith? In fact, tell as many people as you can. Father Powell ends this book of unconditional love by saying, I told them, Tommy, I told them the best I could. Thank you, Lord. It's interesting to me that the story of Tommy is so much like this story of Tommy, this other Thomas that was the doubter. They had a lot in common besides long hair. You know, Thomas was in the same class of faith with Jesus, a teacher, and for some reason, why wasn't he there when the, all the other disciples were, when Jesus appeared to them a week earlier? Where was, where was Thomas? How come he was skipping class? Don't you wonder? And if 10 of your finest friends told you something that they swore was true, wouldn't you believe it? If 10 of your friends told you, we saw the Lord who had been crucified and died, he came, he appeared to us, he spoke to us. Wouldn't you believe it? Not Thomas. Mm -mm. He was a resident atheist too. Thomas didn't believe in the risen Jesus, but like John Powell foretold, but the risen Jesus believed in him and would come to him. And one week later, you know the story. Jesus appeared to the disciples. This time, T was with them. And he came up to him and said, Thomas, come here. Come here, Thomas. I want you to touch my hands and my side. Put your finger and see for yourself that it's truly I who is crucified, who am with you now and always. And Thomas for the first time probably in his life, fell down on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. Do you know in, in John's gospel, it has 21 chapters, that nowhere in all the chapters except that last chapter does anyone express their faith as much as Thomas the doubter? Did you know that? No one stated so clearly and powerfully and emphatically that Jesus was a divine Lord and Savior, my Lord and my God. No one had said that so explicitly up to that time. And Thomas went off from that point to share the whole world, even today what we share with you, that Jesus is truly with us, even though it doesn't seem that way sometimes. Jesus is with us, and he wants to help us with our wounds and our problems. He knows life isn't easy, and there are many days when we can doubt him. 
But occasionally, he really comes through to show us, beyond doubt, he is with us always. I wish I had more time to talk about this theology of faith. That's always my problem. (laughs) Well, you don't have to laugh at that. But let me share a few things. First of all, the whole story of this Tommy and this Thomas teaches us, number one, it's okay to doubt. Really, it's okay to have doubts. It's only human, as long as you avoid two extremes. I think it's wrong, actually, never to have any doubts. If you never have any doubts about anything, for any reason, I wonder how much you think about things, you know? Because the thinking process raises questions, and doubts encourage us to question and search and learn and find deeper answers. I have found doubts can lead to deeper faith. But don't go to the other extreme when you doubt everything. I know people like that. You know people like that. We call them cynics. They question everything, no matter what. And they never get anywhere. Don't, don't do that. Secondly, like Thomas or Tommy, I would encourage you to take your doubts to the Lord and to your friends and express them. Talk about them. Study them. Pray about them. If you're interested really in learning and growing, it's so important. As we learn when we come close to death, faith is really all that matters. I would say we stand on two legs, my friends, faith and love. And without those two, we're the most crippled people in life. Lastly, I want to say this. This may, I don't know, surprise you, but I feel a little bit like Tommy because, as you know, cancer has filled both of my lungs, and I don't know how much time the Lord will give me. And it's led me to ask lots of questions of God and to search and pray and ask the Lord things I... I can't figure out and ha- still haven't heard any clear answers why. But I have felt his love for my family, for my friends and parishioners. I felt his love and I finally have recognized Jesus in all of you. And I sure don't want to forget to tell you that Tommy told his family, I love you. I really do. And I want to show it to you. I don't want this just to be words. I want this to be a statement of my faith in God and in you and in what matters in life. I love you and I want to love you more for as much as I can and long as I can. And I know it will lead us all to a deeper faith. How about you? Do you believe that God bless you always? Amen. I've heard Father Jim give that talk about Tommy several times now. And each time I hear it, I'm inspired to want to live my faith with greater resiliency. I'm Father Michael Sparrow, and Father Jim Willig was my best friend. I think Father Jim would agree that there are still a lot of Tommies out there today, confused young men and women who need a role model who are searching for mentors and teachers to point the way to Jesus. Two inspiring teachers of faith within our own time are two former popes who were canonized on April 27, 2014, Divine Mercy Sunday. Pope Francis canonized them in St. Peter's Square, and I'm delighted to share with you his homily from that historic day. At the heart of this Sunday, which concludes the octave of Easter and which St. John Paul II wished to dedicate to divine mercy, are the glorious wounds of the risen Jesus. He had already shown those wounds when he first appeared to the apostles on the very evening of that day following the Sabbath, the day of the resurrection. But as we have heard, 
Thomas was not there that evening. And when the others told him that they had seen the Lord, he replied that unless he himself saw and touched those wounds, he would not believe. A week later, Jesus appeared once more to his disciples gathered in the upper room. Thomas was also present. Jesus turned to him and told him to touch his wounds. Whereupon that man, so straightforward and accustomed to testing everything personally, knelt before Jesus with the words, My Lord and my God. The wounds of Jesus are a scandal, a stumbling block for faith. Yet they are also the test of faith. That is why on the body of the risen Christ, the wounds never pass away. They remain. For those wounds are the enduring sign of God's love for us. They are essential for believing in God. Not for believing that God exists but for believing that God is love, mercy, and faithfulness. St. Peter, quoting Isaiah, writes to Christians, By his wounds you have been healed. St. John the Twenty-Third and St. John Paul the Second were not afraid to look upon the wounds of Jesus, to touch his torn hands and his pierced side. They were not ashamed of the flesh of Christ. They were not scandalized by him, by his cross. They did not despise the flesh of their brothers because they saw Jesus in every person who suffers and struggles. They were two men of courage, filled with the parousia of the Holy Spirit, and they bore witness before the church and the world to God's goodness and mercy. They were priests and bishops and popes of the 20th century. They lived through the tragic events of that century, but they were not overwhelmed by them. For them, God was more powerful. Faith was more powerful. Faith in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of mankind and the Lord of history, the mercy of God shown by those five wounds was more powerful. And more powerful, too, was the closeness of Mary, our mother. In these two men who looked upon the wounds of Christ and bore witness to his mercy, there dwelt a living hope and an indescribable and glorious joy. The hope and the joy which the risen Christ bestows on his disciples. The hope and the joy which nothing and no one can take from them. The hope and joy of Easter, forged in the crucible of self-denial, self-emptying, utter identification with sinners, even to the point of disgust at the bitterness of that chalice. Such were their hope and the joy which these two holy popes had received as a gift from the risen Lord, and which they in turn bestowed in abundance upon the people of God, meriting our eternal gratitude. This hope and this joy were palpable in the earliest community of believers in Jerusalem, as we have heard in the Acts of the Apostles. It was a community which lived the heart of the gospel, love and mercy, in simplicity and fraternity. This is also the image of the church which the Second Vatican Council set before us. John the Twenty-Third and John Paul the Second cooperated with the Holy Spirit in renewing and updating the church in keeping with her pristine features, those features which the saints have given her throughout the centuries. Let us never forget that it is the saints who give direction and growth to the church. In convening the council, St. John the Twenty-Third showed an exquisite openness to the Holy Spirit. He let himself be led and he was for the church a pastor, a servant leader, 
guided by the Holy Spirit. This was his great service to the church. For this reason, I like to think of him as the Pope of openness to the Holy Spirit. In his own service to the people of God, St. John Paul II was the Pope of the family. He himself once said that he wanted to be remembered as the Pope of the family. I'm particularly happy to point out this as we are in the process of journeying with families toward the Synod on the family. It's surely a journey which, from his place in heaven, St. John Paul II guides and sustains. May these two new saints and shepherds of God's people intercede for the church so that during this two-year journey toward the synod, she may be open to the Holy Spirit in pastoral service to the family. May both of them teach us not to be scandalized by the wounds of Christ and to enter ever more deeply into the mystery of divine mercy, which always hopes and always forgives because it always loves. Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and Internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones. Heart to Heart